I should make it clear at the beginning that uh, secret life shouldn't be confused with secret identity. I don't have a secret identity. I'm not going to be dashing off in the middle of this to change into my Superman costume in a phone booth somewhere. <laughs> um, I don't have a secret identity, but I do have a secret life, and that life is inextricably tied up with my identity as a writer. In fact, secret life and the writing mesh together. Um, I think this idea of a, of a secret life probably begins in childhood. Um, most writers' paths, I think, are formed in childhood. We, um, we enjoy make-believe, we enjoy hiding, we enjoy becoming something else or someone else. Well, actually, all children do, but writers don't give that up when they grow up. They just keep doing it, and they start writing about it in books. My own secret life probably began when I was around the age of 11. I used to share a bedroom with my two brothers. Um, so you can imagine, there wasn't much privacy. And there was a fair amount of teasing and so on. Um, you had to keep to yourself a little bit because you're, you're sharing this world all the time with two other boys, or I was sharing this world all the time with two other boys. And like most boys at that age, I enjoyed boyish things, roughhousing and playing and teasing my brothers or being teased by them. But I actually most preferred reading, especially if it was raining outside. And if my brothers were being too um, raucous and lively, I would retreat under my bed with, a, with my book and a flashlight. And usually one of the two dogs, the smaller one, who seemed to also like cozying up under a bed. Whereas the, other, the bigger dog liked to wrestle with the, with the other two boys. So um, around this time, 12 years old, beginning of adolescence, I bought myself a diary. And um, I think it was maybe the look of the diary that, that really made me want to buy it. It was, it was one of those fake, fake leather things that looked like it had been aged, um, been carried around in a sea captain's pocket or something like that. Um, I didn't have much to write in that diary. Uh, I hadn't done any traveling t to exotic lands. I didn't have any secret treasure maps. Um, so, you know, I wrote down things like the weather, um, which took about one page a month because it was always sunny. Um, I wrote down the scores of my favorite sports teams, uh, maybe the description of uh, a movie I'd seen. Not too many secrets uh, in, my, in my diary. <clears throat> that is until I fell in love with Susie Cooper. Uh, <laughs> Susie went to a girls' school, I went to a boys' school, and we waited at the same bus stop for our respective buses. And uh, Susie was very beautiful, um, so I wrote that down in my diary. Susie is beautiful. Um, I wrote down what she was wearing. Um, if she looked down in my direction, if she looked over in my direction, I would write that down too. Sometimes I wrote our names down together, you know, as if we were married. Susie DeSoto or Lewis Cooper or just Susie and, De Susie and Lewis and a big heart. Now Susie, of course, had no idea that I was in love with her. I'd never spoken to her and if I looked at her and she was looking at me, I immediately turned away and, and blushed. No one knew I was uh, in love with Susie, and I would have certainly died of embarrassment uh, if my infatuation became known, especially if my brothers had found out. But my diary knew that I was in love with her, so that's where I wrote down that Susie was wearing a red sweater that day, or um, that it was raining and she got wet, or that I heard her laughing and her voice sounded like water running over pebbles. Now imagine if my brothers got their hands in my diary and read that Susie's voice sounded like water running over pebbles. That would have been pretty embarrassing. They would have probably teased me relentlessly and then they would have told their friends about it. They might even have stolen my diary and passed it around at school. The news might even have gotten back to Susie Cooper herself and she would think I was the biggest twit in the world and she would probably take a different bus to school and I would never say, see her ever again in my life. So I wrote these things down in code. That's my first secret. Well, the first secret is falling in love with Susie, but this is my second secret. And um, I didn't actually make up the code myself. Um, 
Because when I wasn't busy being in love with Susie Cooper, I was under my bed reading about spies and invisible ink and clandestine radios and coded messages written on the back of postage stamps. And I got the, this code from a, a book called The Big Book of Spies. I mean, anyone in the family could have just opened the book and found, my, uh, found the key to my code but, um, and then deciphered my diary. But luckily, no one in the family was interested in spies. It was a fairly elementary code, uh, you know, something along the lines of assigning a number to, to each letter of the alphabet so that A would not be one, A would be five, and then B would be six, and so on. Um, you know, pretty simple for simple brief messages that spies would exchange. Not really useful for the tedious procedure of transcribing the gushings of a schoolboy crush. But Susie was worth the effort, I thought. So I kept that little diary in a, in a bookshelf next to my bed. I could keep it out in plain sight because, you know, no one could understand what was in there. And when I wasn't home, I liked to think of that book sitting there, the special book that didn't look like anything else except a sea captain's um, journal or something. And I knew that my thoughts were in there, but they were secret thoughts that only I had. They weren't shared with anyone. No one was going to tease me about these thoughts. Um, they belonged to me, and they were in a book. So, you know, being, a, being a little nerdy reader, I think this idea of putting my thoughts into a book was important. It made it more real than just um, thoughts, you know. Um, of course, later, when I, when I left home and I wasn't sharing a room with my snooping brothers anymore, I, uh, I got rid of that code. I didn't have to write um, in code. And of course, by then, the diary had become a journal. So when I was a, a, a student at, um, at art school or at university, I was used to writing things down in that, in that diary. And I was used to thinking about the world. Because if you're a writer, I think you think about things more than other people do. And if you, if you write something down, the very act of writing it down means you've reflected on it. So, you know, when I was a young, a young student, of course, I wrote down, obviously, things about whatever girl I was mooning over. But I also wrote down my dreams, impressions of other people, little descriptions. I wrote down what I was feeling, what I hoped for. You know, at the age of 20, we're just a cauldron of feelings. And being able to write those things down was also a way to maybe understand them or to cope with them. And sometimes I would even write down little ideas for stories. And I had no intention of becoming a writer. It was just I'd gotten into the habit of writing things down. And I realized, you know, that I had developed a secret life. I didn't think of it then as a secret life, but I had a separate life. The life of the mind or the life of the imagination or the life of the emotions. Call it what you will. Um, there was the me that was in public, there was the me that was with my friends or classmates or just walking down the street or hanging out with other people and then there was this other me that was in the book. They're not separate, but the other one was less expressed in public. It's the part of me that was personal in a book that only I read. And you know, that gives you a lot of freedom. If you write for yourself and not for other people to read, you, you get so much freedom. The irony, of course, is now that I want you all to read my ramblings and babblings, and they're not in code. You know? <laughs> but those journals with a, with a secret life where I could be myself, and I think that's kind of a privilege that, uh, that a writer can have that other people maybe can't have. Um, I don't go back to those journals or, or early diaries because I'm, I'm just so embarrassed by how pretentious and naive I was. Um, but I forgive that youngster. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'm going to get back to this idea of being embarrassed uh, uh, later um, because that's pretty important when you, when you go back and, and are embarrassed by your feelings. I think for writers, this idea of the secret book the diary or the journal is a very useless, useful practice because it does let you um, write 
without anyone telling you what to write or how to write. It's like a, a letter to yourself. And, that's, and you, can, you can be as goofy as you like. If you, if you need the code, I can give it to you if you're worried about anyone <laughs> seeing it. But um, think of that when you write, you know, that there is no one going to read it until later. And then you can write anything you like. Um, you get used to confessing. And that's pretty important for a writer, is to confess. So in my title for this talk, when I said a secret life, a writer confesses, I didn't mean I'm going to tell you that I stole from the cookie jar or that I didn't pay my taxes last year. It's a different kind of confession that I'm, that I'm interested in. Um, and that confession is, is difficult for the writer because, you know, it's as difficult as going um, to a therapist, a psychiatrist, or it's as difficult as going to... Um, uh, as difficult as standing in the witness box and being told to, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It's as difficult as, uh, if you're a Catholic, as going into the priest confessional, where, you know, in all those instances, you're not supposed to lie. You're supposed to confess. <laughs> Publishing a book is a confession. That secret that you've been harboring, maybe since you were 11 years old, is suddenly public confession. When I saw my first novel, A Blade of Grass, on a table in a pile in Indigo Books, I didn't feel what you might expect a, a first-time novelist to feel, you know, elation, because isn't that the whole point of writing? You want your book to be published, you want to see it there in the bookstore, you want to hold it up and say, I did that. I felt a kind of terror. I hadn't thought about this really. Here, were, was my secret life, it was now public property. Anybody could look at it, anybody could talk about it, anybody could say anything about it and discuss it. I was going to be exposed. That was the terror, that's the embarrassment that I was talking about. The secret life was necessary, but in one way I didn't want my secrets exposed. Well, you could say, well, you know, keep writing in code then, stop being a public writer. <laughs> <clears throat> the thing, writing is a very solitary occupation. It's private. It's insular. You're looking inward all the time. And the closest thing I can think of to describing the actual activity of writing is dreaming. You know when you're asleep and you dream? It's real, but it's not real. It's you, but it's not you. And it's, and it's very... Personal, everyone's dreams are different and personal, but they can also be very strange. And there are many dreams that we don't tell to anyone because we're just too ashamed of them or we're too embarrassed about them. But the writer has to dream. The writer has to be embarrassed and shamed and confused by their own thoughts. And you have to be confessing your dream. You can wake up in the morning and say, Oh God, I did this in my dream. You're going to feel shame or you're going to feel anger. Your dream can be about um, some kind of weird wish, wish fulfillment. It could be about um, some kind of violence or some kind of sexual things. You don't talk about those in public unless you go to the, the, the priest or the therapist. Um, sometimes you don't even tell your spouse or your partner about what you dreamed. But you should if you're a writer. Those are precisely the things you should talk about. You have to confess your secrets. Otherwise, your book is not going to be authentic. It's not going to be true. Because if you don't have these thoughts, if you don't acknowledge these thoughts, and I'm not saying they have to be aberrant thoughts, but these intensely personal thoughts, <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't make a true book. Fiction is all about being honest. That's a paradox there. We think fiction is made up, but writers know that it isn't made up. It's real and it's honest. And when I read a book, I believe that it's real. I know it's made up, you know, especially if it involves uh, dinosaurs or space travel. You know the writer didn't go to Mars in a, in, a, in a time machine or something like that. But when you're reading the book, you, re you believe it. It's possible. We all have read bad books and we say things like, it, it didn't seem real, it didn't seem true to life, it just didn't seem honest. So, 
you can, to be honest, you can't lie, especially to yourself as a writer. But now you can see the writer's dilemma. You can see my uh, sense of terror when I saw the pile of books there. You don't want people to think that be beneath this, um, this facade, this uh, pleasant, uh, polite fellow is uh, someone with a dark heart thinking dark thoughts and then writing them down. You know, people ask you, is this book based on your experience? And you want to say, well, what about that passage where the boy soiled his pants or the woman inflicted violence on her family or the man thought about committing suicide? And you want to say, no, 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 it's not about me. I made all that stuff up. I don't want to write it to say I made all that stuff up. That's like someone just telling you a bunch of rubbish. I want to think that the writer had those thoughts, had those feelings. Because otherwise, I'm not going to be convinced by the book. I'm not going to be transported by that book. So you say, if you say to people, no, 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 that's not me, it's the character, and they nod and they go, oh, yes, oh, yeah, okay. And they look at your photo and they say, he looks like a nice guy. There's something weird about his eyes, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> so this notion of confession, I understood it. Even though as, as a, before I published, I was um, keeping my secret thoughts and secret journals, um, I didn't understand what public confession meant or how to deal with it as a writer until I published that, um, that novel, The Blade of Grass. And if any of you uh, have read it, you'll know that it's mostly about two women, and the story is told from their point of view, their feelings. Any men in the book are sort of described at a remove or through the women's eyes. So I'm talking in that book in the voice of two women, and one of them is a young black African woman. So obviously people can't say, is that based on your, on your experience? But it is, and I'll explain why in a minute. But people would ask me, so why did you choose to write then from uh, a woman's point of view or to, or to have two women as your main characters? And um, there are a number of, of, of uh, answers to that. I mean, I was conscious of it, obviously. And firstly, that was to help me um, rethink experience. So um, if a mouse runs across the floor, the cliché, of course, is that the women will scream and stand on the table and then the man will chase the mouse with a broomstick or something. But if I'm writing about a mouse running across the floor as Louis de Soto, the man, I would write, and then he jumped off the stage and chased the mouse. Then I thought, well, if I imagine myself as the woman, what would I do? That gave me a fresh way to look at ordinary situations about um, uh, aspirations, about uh, conflict, about power relationships. That's the, that's the reason why I chose to write it like that, because the book is also about power to a large degree, racial power and sexual power and power of, of skin color. But there was another um, revelation that came to me with that book. I didn't want to confess in public. It's my first novel, so there were things in there that were difficult to write about, and I didn't really want people to think I was this or that, you know? I didn't want to be ashamed, or I didn't want to be marked as something like that. And I realized what I had done, why I had chosen that, that, that story. I could have written something else uh, in the I form or about a man, but I realized it was a way for me to confess in public. It was a way for me to write that book without a censor, the inner censor. If I write from a woman's point of view, I don't have to feel um, that it's me. I know it's me. And I might be writing inaccurately. You, know, you could say that women, men and women have different approaches. You could also say we're all just human beings. We feel love, we feel pain uh, in the same ways. I created a surrogate for myself in, in that book. I created an actor. The characters are, are the actors. And then I can be free to say anything because if people say, oh, you're, you're weird or something, I say, no, I'm not, the character is. It freed me, you know. The paradox is by creating a surrogate, creating another me in the form of a woman or a black African woman, I could most be myself when I was writing. I mean, think of Shakespeare. 
He's got jealous liars, Iago. He's got lovesick teenagers in Romeo and Juliet. He's got homicidal wives in, uh, in Macbeth. Midsummer Night's Dream, he's got a man running around with a donkey's head on. We don't think of Shakespeare as being those people, right? We just think of him as Shakespeare, the brilliant, um, brilliant playwright. But if you're a beginning novelist, you maybe just don't have that confidence. So the actor becomes responsible. You're the playwright and the actor comes on. And then that actor can do anything without embarrassing you. So, you know, if people ask you, is this book based on yourself, you can dodge that question in a way by saying, no, it's the actor. Yes, it's based on my own experience, but it's translated by an actor. And that was a real freedom for me to realize why I had chosen to, to um, hide behind my characters because I was, wasn't sure that I was capable of confessing in public. Um, now, with a, with a new book, I, I felt confident enough as a writer to not to have to hide behind the character. Um, I no longer fear being exposed in public or being caught naked in public because I've done it once with that first book and I got over it. And I also found out that most people, critics included, are kind to writers. No one actually comes up to you and says, your photo's nice, but you look kind of weird, you know, in, in public. And, um, so even critics who might not like your, 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 uh, your book are generally kind and they accept um, what you're doing. Um, so, if people say to me, is this book based on your own experience? I say, uh, yes, it is. Um, it's all me. It's also all fiction. It's all true, except for the parts I made up. <laughs> I noticed um, that one of the, uh, the workshops uh, in, in this conference is... Um, uh, by Ray Robertson, it's called Write What You Know, Even If It Hurts. And uh, I'm saying the same thing. Confess. <laughs> so um, that's my secret life. That's uh, today's confession. And um, just before I run down into the phone booth and change into my Superman costume, I'm going to read you a few lines from uh, the Restoration Artist. Um, it's a book about a man who has a good life, a successful life, a young artist uh, living in Paris, 1966. Um, beautiful wife, uh, talented young son, um, a gallery, thriving career, life is good. And, um, you know, in a moment everything disappears, everything crashes, he loses everything, um, including his will his will to be an artist, his will to live. Um, he's reached that point uh, at the beginning of the book, you know, the point of ultimate despair where he doesn't see any way forward or any way back. He just sees that there's an end. Um, something, of course, changes uh, his path to suicide. Um, he leaves Paris and he just drives aimlessly across France until he ends up on the coast of Normandy and takes a boat to a little island out there that's quite sparsely populated. And um, on his first day, first morning there, it's very misty and as he's wandering through the mist, he sees a boy briefly as the mist parts. And that boy looks just like the son he lost, the ten-year-old son he lost. He's standing on the edge of a cliff, sort of looking into the abyss at that moment. And when he sees the boy, um, his hand is stayed. The mist closes, uh, he doesn't find the boy, and he sort of starts to ask around on the island, does any, anybody know about a boy there? And, um, people don't tell him anything. They say, no, we don't know of any boy, we haven't seen any boy, or so on. So he's not sure if he's hallucinating, if his grief is, has, has driven him, you know, figuratively over the edge. Um, anyway, uh, here he goes uh, wandering around the island again. It's just a couple of pages. Um, the track meandered left away from the dunes and across a heath where a flock of crows rose into the sky, protesting my presence, black flutterings on blue. And just visible through a dense grove of pines on the far side of the heath was a rooftop, and I made my way in that direction. 
who was immediately quiet, quieter in the trees, away from the breeze and the sound of the waves. Underfoot lay a carpet of dried pine needles. I hadn't walked very far when I heard a peculiar sound, a quick squawk, like a choked off call of a gull. I assumed it was some kind of a bird. Then the sound came again, like a voice, but not a voice, and not a bird either. I stopped. The breeze sighed in the pines softly. Then the sounds came again, rapidly, from some sort of musical instrument, a clarinet maybe. I moved forward, almost tiptoeing, my steps cushioned by the pine needles. But when I stepped on a dried branch, the crack of the snapping wood was loud as a gunshot. And the sound stopped immediately. I remained motionless, holding my breath, peering into the shadows. All was silence. The afternoon heat rose in waves from the ground at my feet. The resinous smell of the pines was thick. I waited. Then the strange, otherworldly sounds filled the grove again. Half a dozen goats came into view, foraging among the rocks or stretching their necks to nibble the leaves at the edges of branches. And just past them, a figure was perched on the rocks, holding a clarinet, the boy. He was barefoot and shirtless, wearing only a pair of tattered shorts. The afternoon light fell upon his dark curls and his bare brown shoulders and touched the clarinet so that it shone like gold. He played on, unaware of my presence. It was a crude and strange music, but music nevertheless. He seemed to be learning as he played, inventing and repeating sequences, finding notes, mostly off-key, but then hitting right notes. Then, for some reason, the goats all raised their heads at the same time and stared across the clearing. The boy stopped playing. He looked directly at me, calmly, confidently, but his expression was inscrutable. Then with two quick leaps, he sprang from the rocks to the floor of the clearing. Wait, I called. I went forward a few paces, raising my hand, reaching out. The boy moved further away, farther away. Wait, please. I reached into my pocket and my fingers closed around Piero's silver whistle. Piero was his son who had a, a whistle. I raised it to my mouth and blew softly, pursing my lips so that the ball inside the whistle barely revolved. And the sound that came was not the shrill metallic signal that Piero liked, but something like the cooing of a dove. The boy looked at me with curiosity, his eyes moving from my face to the gleaming silver whistle. He took a couple of tentative steps towards me and his features became more clearly visible. I stared into his face. He resembled Piero, the thick, unruly hair, his way of moving, something about the alert way he held his head. But the eyes that looked back at me were not those of my son. Holding the whistle on the flat of my palm, I extended my hand to the boy. Here, take it, try it. You can have it. Flecks of grass and pine needles were caught in his dark curls. And on his neck there was a welt of lighter skin, a scar encircling his throat, like a necklace. Slowly he came closer and his hand stretched up, tentatively hovering, reaching for the gleaming silver whistle on my palm. Take it, I whispered. His forefinger touched the metal surface. And as his hand opened to grasp the whistle, I reached out and clasped my fingers around his wrist. Without warning, he bent his head and sank his teeth into my hand, a sharp nip as quick as a fox. With a cry, I released him and he sprang away, bounding towards the trees, and the goats scattered and dashed after him. And for a long while I stood there, alone in the silence, in the emptiness, rubbing my fingertips back and forth along the skin of my wrist. Then I bent down and retrieved the whistle 